Okay, so here we are, April 21st. Um, so we did our little uh, welcome. If there are any comments or questions anybody wants to add before we get started, we'll, we'll come right back to that. Um, following our uh, really fun show that we had last time, we, we talked about different things we wanted to review as a group, things that would be of interest to you, and things that John and I saw that we thought we might uh, bring back for another discussion. One of those items was on sharpening, and so I'm going to spend a little bit of time reviewing some of the charts that we already talked about. I added a couple charts, I think, but uh, it's basically a review of the whole notion of sh sharpening. Uh, another, item that we another item that we talked about was uh, the composition of a carving. And so John put together a few slides on um, his thoughts on what to start thinking about in terms of composition. So that'll be the, at least the start of that discussion. We might come back to expand on that in, uh, in other sessions like these. Um, another item that, uh, well, a no number of items that we talked about uh, from a show perspective that we thought we'd like to come back to, uh, it just so happened I started a new carving uh, a week and a half ago or so, and I thought it'd be a good opportunity for us to just go through step by step how that carving is coming and talk about the various aspects of it as we go along. So as an example, it's the, the carving is a cowgirl. And so one of the first things I did was carve the hat and, uh, and place the hat on the head. So I have a few slides that I wanna review with you, just uh, remind you what we talked about in terms of putting a hat together, placing it on the head and the, the technique you go about uh, to, to make that look nice. We also talked about the notion of modeling and sculpting. And so how do you, how do you model um, the wooden carving, the wood carving that you're gonna make in clay or some other medium? and sculpt that so that you then have a 3D uh, model of what you're about to carve. And so um, I approached this carving in that fashion. So I made a model and a, and a sculpture of it. And I'll show you what I did in doing that and, uh, and get your ideas, your own, your own ideas on how you do that as well. And then at the end, if anybody has any tips that they want or tricks or techniques that they want to share, that'd be terrific as well. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, let's just uh, open it up for, for 60 seconds. If anybody has any questions or comments uh, at all, now's the time. Okay. Quite proud. Yeah, that's okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> So let's start with sharpening. So I, I put down a couple of uh, statements here. <laughs> the first one, now someone said this, if you have six hours to chop down a tree, spend the first four hours sharp sharpening your ax. It's a great saying. It was actually attributed to Abraham Lincoln, but it's since been uh, refuted that it wasn't Abraham Lincoln who said that. I don't know who said it. It's a great saying. And it's particularly great in terms of uh, what we do from a carving standpoint. You know, John and I have both uh, talked quite a bit about carving with a sharp knife. And, it, and you got to prepare for that. I mean, you just, you just don't wake up in the morning and pick up an old knife and expect to be able to enjoy your carving or end up with a really nice carving. You have to work at it. Um, and the work is generally honing or polishing the knife. And that's something you've heard John and I both say, I think, several times that every, every 15 minutes or so while we're, while we're uh, do, making a carving, while we're enjoying carving, we'll stop and we'll hone or polish the knife just on a, just on a leather strop. So keep that in mind. Like if you have six hours to chop down a tree, spend the first four hours sharpening your ax. And so if you're gonna be doing carving, make sure you spend ample amount of time making sure that knife is sharp and stays sharp. Now, as I said, somebody said that, I don't know who said it. Uh, what I say, and so you can quote me on this and, and, it's, and it's just my viewpoint and, and my opinion on this. And my opinion would be, unless there's damage to the knife or the gouge, or unless you know there's been significant wear, you've been using the knife on or gouge on something other than a soft wood, um, try to avoid sharpening it on a stone. If you, can, if you can buy a knife with its manufactured edge on it and do nothing more than polish that to keep it really honed, sharp, and useful to you, 
that's the best way to manage your knives. I have knives that I've probably been using for six or seven years that have never seen a sharpening stone. They've only been on leather with polishing compound. Um, now, if, if I, as I said, if I drop the knife or I drop the gouge and, and now I'm using it on the wood and I can see it's leaving a scratch or a scar in the wood, even a, a microscopic one, I know, okay, there's a problem with that now. It needs a, I won't polish that out. I need to bring it to a, to a very fine grinding stone. So, um, so, so keep those two things in mind. I don't know, John, if you have anything, anything that you'd like to say to add to yeah, that. Um, yeah, I, I, I listen to my knife. You got the knife, when you have a sharp knife, you can hear the knife cut the wood. Just a nice, it's like skiing, you know, just nice slidings. So what I do, I just put on some music, and just relax and you know get all the little burrs out of there and take your time but listen to your knife if it, if it starts you can't hear it it means it's dull and you must be able to feel it too but you just hone it for like uh, 10 on each side and start over again right okay now i showed you this picture before this is what this would have been a knife that i used as a kid to start carving now, in fair, now, now, I'll tell you a couple things about this knife. My dad told me how to sharpen knives, and that was with a, with a, uh, with a stone and uh, put oil on the stone, and I would, in a circular motion, just sharpen and sharpen and sharpen this knife. This knife was a lot fatter when I had it as a kid, and you can see how it's been uh, skinnied down just by sharpening and sharpening and sharpening. Um, now, in fairness to this knife, you know, it probably went decades after I carved with it and got used for a variety of things and got roughened up. But this is a dull knife. And this is what a dull knife does to basswood. And so you can take a look at that. And you can see that chunk of basswood, even though I carved that chunk of basswood with the grain in the right direction to make a real optimum cut. You can see how it pulled all the fibers up. It pulled fibers up and it broke the fibers instead of severing neatly the fibers in the wood. It also left these huge scratches, okay? And so you typically wouldn't be using as dull a knife as this to do your carving. But if you see any scratch at all, even a microscopic scratch, like maybe you can see these up here, that means you have a scratch on your knife edge or your gouge if you're using it, and that has to be dealt with. That won't be polished out. Okay, but that's what that's what a dull knife looks like cutting a piece of basswood. And you know, we saw some great carvings uh, in our show, but I would say, you know, aside from maybe two or three or four of the carvings that we saw, there was some evidence somewhere in everybody's carving of a dull knife. There was a lot of evidence of a sharp knife but you could look and see some evidence of a dull knife being used. And so here's what I'll say to you. And, and, and then again, this is all my opinion. Everybody has different points of view on sharpening, but my, my opinion yeah. is this. You, you, everybody will just wanna make sure you're muted, okay? Unless you have a question or something. But my, my opinion would be this, that Regardless of where you are in your development as a carver and the techniques you use and the tools that you use, uh, if you work with a sharp knife, if you go to your tools and sharpen your knives the way John and I are going to try to talk about it in the next few minutes, you'll improve your carving probably by 20%. So you won't be a better carver, you won't be, your technique won't change, your knives and tools don't change, nothing changes except you are now working with a sharp knife. And that alone will have you become a better carve by, and I'll bet it improves your carvings by 20%. And as John was saying earlier, it, it, it'll improve your enjoyment of carving by 20% because now it's that nice smooth carving. It's not, you're not tugging at it. You're not tearing at the wood. You're making crisp cuts that you're happy with. The next slide here is, um, a knife I've been using probably for the last six or seven years. This is one that has never gone to the grinding stone. And this is, a, this is an example of a sharp knife now. So you can see that, you know, there's probably a 32nd of an inch band there, the cutting edge that is ultra, ultra sharp and, and, uh, and shiny in this picture. 
when you look at a knife like this, and many knives are made like this, there's a flat section, there's a primary beveled section, and then there's a secondary beveled section. It's this secondary beveled section that you're, that you're sharpening and that you're carving with. You know, you can, you can elect to polish all the way up to that bevel if you want, but it'll just be cosmetic. You're not cutting anything with that bezel, bevel. You're cutting with this bevel. The first thing that hits the wood, that's what you're cutting with. And that's what's got to be absolutely surgically sharp. And here's what a surgically sharp knife will do to basswood. And so, you know, th this photograph probably doesn't do it justice because in the right light, this actually looks, every cut looks like it's been waxed. It's, it's so smooth, it looks like it's been waxed. If, in fact, if you rub your finger over it, it's slippery like you had applied wax to it. And that just means every grain in that piece of wood, and, and think of grains as like hair-like capillaries going up and down the wood, right? Every one of those capillaries have been cut cleanly uh, with an ultra sharp knife. Not one of those capillaries, pieces of grain has been torn and are sticking up out of the wood. Okay, and, that, and that's what you're after. Any comments, just, just uh, jump in everybody. And so what I did was I thought to myself, just preparing for this little discussion, I went down to the kitchen and I got one of our kitchen knives. So this is just one of the Perry knives, good set of knives. It comes in one of those blocks. You probably have the same thing on your kitchen counter, big knives, you know, big butcher knives, the, the same quality as this. And I, and I just, every time I use a knife or, or Peggy uses a knife in the kitchen, I'll sharpen it. And what I do is I just take one of those rods out. It's in the butcher block. You take a rod out and you sharpen it back and forth like, uh, like you see the chefs do on TV. And, I, and it's a sharp knife. I mean, you, when you cut turkey or roast beef with it, it cuts really nicely. When you cut vegetables, it cuts really nicely. So I thought to myself, well, I wonder how sharp it is. So I took a piece of basswood and I cut it and it's horribly dull. <laughs> so that's that super sharp knife that I sharpened before I cut roast beef. And, and when I sharpen them, I always say to Peggy, be careful, the knife's been sharpened so that she doesn't cut herself or that I don't cut myself. That's what it did to a piece of basswood. So I cut in the right direction along the grain, and you can see all of the tears in the grain. So all of those capillaries, all of that grain, those filaments have been all torn up despite it being what I felt was a pretty sharp knife. Here's the same piece of wood on the same track of wood with that sh sharp knife with my carving knife, this one, to, to compare. So that's that waxed look, that super sharp waxed look. This is the super sharp kitchen knife that we use to cut our food and are happy with it, but that's how poorly a cut it is on basswood. So just think about force, that. How much force do you have to have on that, Mark? Well, that's, yeah, and that's the other point, isn't it, John? Like, you really feel yeah. the difference. You really feel the difference. The one on the right, you just, you know, if you're pulling that knife towards you against your thumb, you're feeling it just glide. The other one, you're feeling it tug all the way. And, yeah. and, those, were, and those were small cuts. I mean, I, you can see how much I zoomed in. That's my thumb there. Those were just small cuts, and yet it was just a real coarse pull, right? So just think about that in your own instance, you know, um, uh, the, the knives that you're using today, take a look at your carvings. Are you seeing mostly these kinds of cuts? Are you seeing mostly these kinds of cuts? Or are you seeing some areas are, are like this and some areas are like this? Uh, you know, if you're seeing stuff like that, it means that although you think you have a really sharp knife, just like Peggy and I think we have a really sharp kitchen knives, when it comes to carving, they're really not sharp unless they're really surgically sharp. And so, so just keep that in mind. Now here's, a, here's an er, a real early carving that I would have done of a mountain man. And, and again, you can see with the knives that I was using at the time, and, and I felt I was sharpening them well, you can see all the burrs here, you can see all the tears, you can see, you can see the striations here in the shoulder, right? Those weren't intended to be there. Now, in fairness, you can see most, some other spots, they look pretty nice. You know, maybe up in the hat here, they look pretty, pretty reasonable. But you can see other parts where the wood just got torn. And you can see it in this picture too. You can see where the, the knife stopped and tore the wood rather than cut it smoothly and left it really fresh. You can see it up here. I didn't intend these things to be there. They ended up being there only because the knife wasn't as sharp as it should be. The other thing you see when your knife isn't as sharp as it should be, this dullness down here. 
So, you know, in this case, the grain was going in this direction. So this was all exposed grain here that I was cross cutting with the knife. And you could see that it, it left it very dull and, you know, microscopically rough or jagged. And that's just because the knife wasn't sharp. Now, a more recent carving would have been this one. And so, you know, the head of this hockey player that I did is probably no more than, I don't know, an inch and a half in diameter. I zoomed in a lot, but you can see the, the, the freshness of the cuts are much, much better. And in fact, this eye is probably no more than about, I don't know, uh, an eighth of an inch. But there's no way that I would have been able to cut into basswood and had those eyelids there without breaking them unless the knife was super sharp. Like I would never have been able to take that kitchen knife or the jackknife that I showed you and done that. I would have crushed all that wood and it would have broken off along the grain. I needed that super sharp, sharp knife so that I could just make one pass and that piece just fell out. Okay. Any questions on that? I like to add too, Mark, is the safety, the safety part of it too, of a sharp knife compared to a dull knife. You're going to cut yourself. If you have a dull knife, you're going to end up cutting yourself. It's going to slide past where you want to go and it's going to, you're going to get cut. So a sharp knife is a safe knife. That's right. Thanks, John. Okay. Where am I here? Okay. So let's talk about sharpening then. Hopefully, I, hopefully John and I are selling you on sharpening. Uh, you know, it, it's, you, you, you want to get into your carving and it's fun to do the carving and it's, it's difficult to kind of stand back and say, oh, geez, I got to do a little preparation. But, but if, if you buy into what we're saying and you give it a try, your, your carvings truly will improve by 20% and you truly will enjoy carving more. So I hope, you, I hope we're making the sale here for you. So let's talk about how to sharpen. Um, so, you know, I, I said to you earlier that uh, if you at all can avoid it, don't bring your knife to a stone. If you have brought it to a stone, you've taken the manufacturing edge off it. So we're going to talk about how to bring that really sharp edge back to it. And certainly, as I said earlier, if you've damaged the knife, if you've driven it into something or used it for something that other than carving, like cutting a piece of glue or something, um, or if it's just been worn down by, by uh, carving really hard wood, then you have to bring it to a stone. So let's talk about that. So I think most people uh, know about sandpaper and it comes in different degrees of what's called grit. And, you know, so in this picture I have on the right hand side, that is a, just an old chunk of sandpaper that is 80 grit. And you can see how abrasive that would be and how aggressive that would be on a piece of wood. If you've used an 80 grit, it's because you've had a real rough piece of wood and you just want to bring it down to something manageable. It leaves a lot of scratches in the wood. Medium sanding would probably be about 180 grit is what we'd call it. Um, and so that's what you'd normally buy at the home hardware to do just regular sanding before you did a little bit of painting. Fine sanding is when you get down to somewhere between say 320 grit and 600 grit. The paper on the, uh, on the left-hand side is, happens to be 600 grit, and very, very fine. In fact, uh, I've heard it said that if you take a, uh, an old brown paper lunch bag, you remember the, the heavier lunch bags, and if you were to, able to crumple that all up and then, then, uh, then uh, smooth it out, that's about seven or 800 grit. So that's how smooth, you know, six, seven, eight hundred grit is. It's very, very smooth. All right. Now, grit. Just as a reminder, grit is just a measure of um, the size of the particle that ends up getting glued to the paper. And so, eighty grit means that if you had a screen or a mesh that was one inch by one inch, so one square inch, you would count eighty holes in that screen. All right, so 80 particles would fall through one square inch screen. If you had 600 grit, it means it's even finer mesh your screen. 600 particles would fall, fall through that mesh in a one square inch pattern, okay? And so that's, that's all that grit means. When it comes to um, stones, it, it's, it's sort of the same thing. Um, most stones that you and I would, uh, sharpening stones that you and I would get 
are measured in grit. Some of them are measured in microns. Uh, I'm really not all that familiar with microns. I go by grit. There is a conversion if you end up buying something in micron. They usually show you what it is in grit. <laughs> if they don't, you can do the conversion pretty quickly. But it's the same sort of notion as, uh, as sanding when you're using a stone. So one of the things I, I wanted to mention here that I, that I didn't is you can imagine that if you started with something as coarse as this 80 grit sandpaper and you wanted a smooth piece of wood, you'd never be able to get it by going right to 600 grit. So you can't go from coarse sanding to fine sanding and expect a <coughs> piece of wood. You have to take steps. You have to go through the coarse sanding and then get those big ruts out of the way by going through medium sanding and then get those medium ruts out of the way by going from, to fine sanding. Okay, you can't go from coarse to fine. It's the same thing with a stone. So with when you're sharpening, you know, you're probably <coughs> looking at um, coarse sharpening, probably about 600 grit would start at very coarse sharpening if you had a really badly damaged knife. Medium sharpening would be about 1,200 grit. You'd be getting at fine sharpening, probably about 4,500 grit. And when you and I, <laughs> when you and I go to, everybody wants. I'll just mention again. Everybody wants to just go on mute, okay, so that uh, so that we don't hear you um, in the background. So when you go to honing and polishing, um, that's probably 40 to 50,000 grit. Okay, so so it's the same sort of notion. If you're if you have a knife that you've decided you need to bring to the stone to a stone, you can't go from 600 grit and go immediately to polish it to 50,000 grit. There's no way you'll get those ruts out. You have to go through stepwise from coarse to medium to fine, and then honing and polishing it. Okay. Any comments? Um, I had one actually. Um, it's Daniel from Grand Bend. Uh, they have out now uh, di diamond cards, and there it's fine diamond uh, particles instead of the uh, typical grit that uh, you see on sandpaper on cards. And you they usually sell them in a package of three uh, to do just exactly that. You start at the lower one and you move yourself up and uh, they really seem to do a very good job. Hmm. They're a lot more friendlier than the yes, the uh, some of the sharpening stones that of you know that are out. Hmm. So so this is a thin card, Daniel. Yeah, yeah, it's oh, just a, it's a steel card with diamond uh, on the on the surface of it. Yeah, and I've got a couple myself, and, I, and if I'm really in trouble, I'll, that's what I'll use. Very good. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at the process of sharpening. So this is back to that knife that I had. And really what we're sharpening is that first that uh, first bevel right there. Okay, we're not sharpening anything more than that 32nd of an inch bevel that you see right there. And so what does that look like? And so what I've shown here, here's the flat, here's a cross section. So this is the flat cross section of that knife. Here's that first bevel that I pointed out to you. And here's that secondary bevel that's a 32nd of an inch or so. And that's really the only sharpened section that you're gonna manage on your knife, okay? That's not to say you, you don't, you could polish all this if you want, it's just not gonna help you in your carving at all. It's this, it's this part that, that uh, contacts the wood. Okay, so what does it look like? So if you had a stone, you're going, to, you're going to put the knife up on an edge like that. It's gonna be on an edge, so you get at that primary 132nd of an inch section of that bevel right there. Now, some people say, you know, how, how far do you bring that up? You, it's not far. Somebody, some people say you can put a quarter behind this, a coin behind this, a quarter, and that's about the right thing. You know, you, you play it by ear, but you'll be able to see by looking at it if you're getting at that section that you want to get at. Now, I pull the knife across the stone. That's just the way I do it. It's, it's, I'm not saying it's the only way to do it. It's just the way I prefer to do it. Some people push the knife across the stone. Some people go in a, in a circular motion. I just happen to go always drawing it towards myself when I'm, when I'm uh, stoning a, a, a knife. What happens is if you do this a multiple of times, and this isn't, you just isn't something you do, okay, once or twice, I've got it done. This may be like 20 times or more that you're, you're going 
pulling this uh, knife back against that bevel on the stone. And what's happening kind of microscopically is a piece of that metal is coming off and it's starting to form a little bit of a lip right there. And if you, when you do this, you know, just take the edge of your fingernail, not along the knife where you're going to cut yourself, but away against the knife. And you'll feel that little ridge there. You'll feel a little bump there. And that just means the, the material is being moved away from the knife. The metal material is curling up here. And so then you just turn it around. You turn it around and, and turn it over. And now that piece that was originally down here breaks off and you start forming a new piece here. And you take maybe 20 you know, strokes, if you want, on the knife in that direction. And so that's how I, I go about it. And, and as we said earlier, it's a matter of uh, going in a progression. So whether you have the diamond cards that Daniel uh, mentioned or whether you've gone out and purchased some uh, different sharpening stones, depending on the damage on your knife, you might start with a 600 grit. Then you go to the 1200 medium grit. Then you go to the 4500 grit. Now I'll tell you, I stop at 4500 grit. Um, real pros who really take sharpening seriously would even go as high as 8,000 grit. Again, my opinion is uh, I'm fine with the 4,500 grit and then taking it to a, to a honing, uh, to a leather uh, strop. Uh, I get some good results out of that. Um, so, you, you know, where do you get this stuff? As Daniel said, you, you know, you can get the cards, you can go to a Lee Valley or a, a carving shop or a specialty shop and you can get these various stones. Uh, the, the cheapest I've seen these stones are probably around 50 bucks. So they're not inexpensive if you were to get three of them. But if I were to get three, I'd probably, I'd probably look at what I have right now. Right now, I'd say, you know, I've got some pretty old uh, stones that are probably about 600 grit. I'd probably buy a 1200 and a 4500 if, if I only had the 600 grit. So if you, if you have something like this lying around your house, that your, your dad gave to you, like these ones my dad gave to me, they're probably 600 grit or so. And so they're a pretty coarse uh, step in terms of grinding your knife. And I'll say again, I used that 600 grit for years as a young man on my knives, thinking that I was making them sharper, but I was probably making them duller. It's not until you get to the 1200 and finally the 4500 that you start to get a sharp knife. Now I do have this downstairs and this is a, um, this is about a 4,500 grit stone. It's circular, it, it runs pretty fast. I'd say it's faster than like a 45 RPM record. It has a post back here that a tray, a basin sits in and that basin drips water onto it. And so as this spins around, you can just put your knife one way and put your knife the other way. And that brings it pretty sharp at a, and I'm saying it's probably about a 4,500 grit. From that point, I hone it. And so, uh, you know, whenever I'm carving, I keep this particular thing at uh, my desk. This is manufactured by FlexCut. It just has a little leather strip on the edge. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of spots. This is wood. There's a couple of spots you can fit different types of uh, gouges in. If you flip it over, there's more contours like this with other gouges. I'd say every 15 minutes, I'll take a knife and I'll just strop it on here, or I'll find the right trough for the gouge that I'm using, and I'll just pull it back, you know, 10 or 15 times. And that just keeps it sharp enough for me. The, um, the honing compound I use just happens to be a honing compound, a polishing compound from uh, Lee Valley. Um, and again, um, you know, you're talking when you're using these honing compounds, you're now up around 40 to 50,000 grit. So again, it's only after you've hit that 4,500 stone that you'd bring it to a, a polishing compound or else it's really not gonna have any effect on getting any of those gouges out that the stone put in. And I also have this. And so this is just a, um, a little four inch disc uh, sander made by Delta. It has a one inch uh, belt that goes on it. You can buy a one inch leather band that uh, you can replace the sand, sand belt with. And, and I put that on, I put the, I just by hand, I put the rubbing or the polishing compound on that. And then I just run that. It runs really too fast, I believe, for, uh, for honing. So I move pretty quickly back and forth with the knife. 
The only thing that um, I'll mention to you again, I know I mentioned it to you last time because it's a concern of mine. These often run in different directions. The one you're looking at here happens to run in this direction. And so because it runs down, the sharp edge is always pointing down. When I turn the knife around, the sharp edge always points down. If the sharp edge points up, it'll bite into the leather, it'll throw the knife out of your hand and it's a real, it's a real danger to you. So, so just really be aware when you're using these, okay? All right, I am gonna stop the screen share. Hey, Mark. Yep. Sorry. Um, the machine Delta that you just showed I know I have a similar Mastercraft knockoff type, and uh, one of our guys in our club, uh, Rick Lacroix, is really good at sharpening. He f told me to just flip it over. Um, it's kind of awkward, but you can turn yeah. it upside down, and because I prefer the other way. Yeah. Because uh, I have a short-term memory issue. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so I don't touch that one. I yeah. have a special machine that he made for me. But yeah. yeah, if anybody has that, you can, he's made a jig that turns it around, but yeah. Uh, it's yeah and, I've, and I've seen some that are made for carving surge that, uh, that run automatically in yeah. that direction from up, up, run up so that you can see the blade as you go. The, the key is to make sure, as you say, to remind yourself what you're doing because because that uh, that sharp edge of the blade can cut into that knife pretty quickly, and you won't be able yeah. to hold onto the knife. Yeah. And if you have the like, I have a leather uh, belt to go on it, and if you forget, uh, that one's a lot more expensive. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. exactly. Just wanted to add that. Thanks. That's right. Thank you, Mark. Mark, can I jump in for a second? You bet. Um, I use the the little flex cut thing too, but what I did was I like the little grooves for sharpening. The specialty tools and that. So I added grooves along the ends, both ends of them. I put in hmm. more grooves and I added a few more down below just to fill it all in. So I Very just good. made more use of it with Very the tools good. that I use all the time. That's a really good idea. That's a really good idea. So you what'd you do? Just put it like on a table saw or something like that? To make yeah, I just took the I took the tool that I use a lot of, and I gouged it out. Yeah, gouged it out, yeah, great. And then I put the stuff in the uh, the grit or whatever it is, and, and it out. that's a great yeah. idea. Great idea. Yeah. All right, me again, Mark. Mark, uh, go, ahead. go ahead. Okay, Mark. Um, a couple things that we found at our carving club was um, we had a couple instances where people. Um, could have been hurt um, using the using the, the power belt, and uh, so we made a requirement at our at our carving club that um, you you have to take part in a training session, and we go through every step, and we've got big signs on the on the machine to show which way the belt is going, and uh, and I think that's a really good thing, and we'll review that every once in a while, maybe every year. We'll, we'll get all our carvers together for maybe, you know, 10 minutes or so and just quickly go over all the safety concerns because, like I said, we had two incidents and they could have turned out really bad. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, sometimes people have a hard time when they're, when they're sharpening a, a gouge or, or a knife to know if they're getting the angle right and, and know exactly where it's, where it's laying on the sharpening uh, stone. So an easy way to do, if you just take a Sharpie and you run the Sharpie along the edge and back a little bit, and yeah. then you, and then you, you sharpen your, your blade or your gouge, and then look at it with a magnifying glass, you can tell whether, whether you're sharpening the edge or whether you're back too far or, or the angle is correct. That's a good, good idea. idea. Yeah, but both those are great ideas. Thanks. I use that all the time. It really works well. It no, gives good, you a, yeah. good, a good indicator on how you're holding your knife. Yeah, very good. Serge, were you going to make another point as well? Yeah, uh, I just, when I first started carving uh, in our club, you know, John Bowser, um, mm -hmm. he used to give all the sharpening course at Lee Valley. He told me, he said, you don't need all the, you know, the flex cut things or just get a piece of scrap basswood. And every tool that I bought, I would run that tool right down to the edges in it. 
and then spread that Lee Valley green stuff. Yeah, so same with And Dave. the other thing that he added, he says, if you put a little bit of oil, um, three in one oil, it, that the Lee Valley, I find it's the best compound, the mm. green compound. It's worth more than gold, I think. Um, but if you put a little bit of that three in one oil, it, it's even, it, it, it helps it even more. And I still have this block of wood. Uh, it's about six by six inch by an inch thick to this day. And any, especially the V tools, you know, okay. you, you run that channel right up to the top of the wings and you just keep doing it and you get a crisp, crisp cut all the way. So yeah. anyways, that's, that's good. All those, those are all good uh, suggestions, good tips. So, uh, so I'll, I'll leave that as a, as a subject that we've touched on now for a second time. I, I hope that it convinces you to at least go back and take a look at the tools that you're using. And, um, and even though you're looking at them and thinking, geez, that's a sharp tool, like doubt yourself, doubt yourself and take another good look at it. If, if you know you've brought it to a stone, your, your knife to a stone, you know, have the mindset that you've probably taken the manufacturer's edge off that and you're not going to be able to polish it back and you need to do a little bit of repair. So you need that stone that is at least, you know, up to a 4,500 grit to get it back to a point where you can bring it to a polishing station. So I hope that was helpful. Okay, we're going to share again here, and John, you're going to talk to us about um, composition. Okay, this is this is uh, my approach to uh, putting a carving together. My comp, my how I do it. I always uh, start out with um, what's the story? What's the story I want to this Bob Ross that I'm doing right now? As uh, what's the story that I want to um, say, and what's uh, and what would be my focal point and stuff like that. And what I do is I choose reference material. So I, at, this, at this carving right now, it's a static carving. It's just standing up there. And it's not much of a story. So I can improve on that. So I, um, uh, I want to get the viewer. So the next one is, is the, the painting. So I'm adding to this carving. I'm adding to this uh composition so but i already decided at the beginning that i want to put like i did some research on bob ross i, I paint like him and stuff like that so i know a lot about him already <clears throat> so uh, knowing that i know that he liked animals he liked the wildlife so my idea for this carving was to uh, carve a carving of in the wildlife, he loved wildlife outdoors. He loved, he loved the animals and stuff. So I wanted to put it all together into one curving. So um, choosing reference material, pictures, and and you got to think about uh, proportion, like the little baby deer there, the raccoon, the squirrel. If I made a big, you know, a squ the squirrel uh, like an inch bigger, it wouldn't be proportion to the rest of the carving. So you got to think of proportions when you're doing a, a composition. Um, and what, what do I want to exaggerate? See, like his hands are exaggerated. It's we're working on caricatures, right? So uh, I want to exaggerate the little raccoon, make him look more cartoony. And, uh, you know, uh, what, would, what do I want to exaggerate? And a lot of carvings you want to exaggerate. Say if somebody's got feet that are big, or you know that person has big feet, you want to make him even bigger. Or you want to make the, he's got a big nose, want to make his nose even bigger. You got to like uh, work on that kind of stuff. And then uh, color. How do I, to um, increase the, uh, say right now in this covering right now, I'm, I have Bob Ross there and we're, everybody's like the focal point is the painting and the, the paint brushes. So I got him, as a viewer, you're looking right into the first first thing you look at is Bob Ross and you look in his eyes and I got the paintbrush pointing towards the painting. I have the squirrel point, pointing up to the painting, the raccoon and the deer are all pointing up to that, the focal point. So that draws you like the tail on the raccoon draws you from the base and draws you back up. The tail on the squirrel draws you right up. And that's the kind of things you got to look at is um, what, your eye draws to you want to draw the eye to whatever you want to your focal point you can use the painting as uh you know you point branches towards 
different things, what you want your focal point is. And uh, like I said, the color, choose your colors. Like my, the one time I, what, I, what I do too is I take a photograph of it and I paint it with color with uh, pencils and choose different colors. And uh, that's how I work out my composition. The, the grass is pointing up towards the focal point as the focal point is the middle of the carving. Uh, the, the paint, the brushes, the brushes pointing towards the, the painting. Uh, uh, the creases in his arms are pointing towards the cake. Uh, so if you, if you look at it for the viewer, it draws you all up, up to that painting. You always draw into the middle of the carving. So think of that when you're doing your composition, working on a carving, a multiple piece carving. Mm -hmm. And that evolves over time, doesn't it, John? Like, like right. I know I've, I've, I've started carvings thinking the character is going to be doing this thing. And as I carve it, you can tell that the character is not going to suit doing that thing. And you, you change, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. The tubes of paint on the, on, the, on the tree trunk, I got it painted. I got it pointing towards where I want everybody to go to, everyone uh, to look at. So these are little uh, things that you, when you do a multiple carving, you got to look at, you got to think about. That's great, John. Good. Okay, any questions for John or any anything that you'd want to add to that? Anybody? Just a compliment. That, that was really nice, John. Very nicely done. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. You know that John painted that painting, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is pretty incredible in itself yeah i know good grief yeah <laughs> okay i'll go back to it again see if i had that squirrel facing outward the the eye the draw your eye would draw and you would be going off the end of the, the carving you wouldn't look at the carving or if i had that raccoon it would, uh, it would facing be, the other way you don't I, want it would draw to your eye away from the middle of the carving. You don't want something direct distracting you. That's right. Well, that's all I got for now. <laughs> no, that's great, John. Thank you. Any, any questions for John? Okay, thanks, John. Okay, so as we were saying, um, I started a little carving of a cowgirl playing a musical instrument here. And uh, so I'm just going to be bringing that back and showing you um, the different uh, phases of doing that. And John and I are both going to use that as an example of just reminding you of some of the things that we've talked about that, uh, that you run into if you uh, haven't already run into while you're doing your caricature. So th this happens to be my carving, and, uh, but John is going to uh, help me with this. He's going to participate in this discussion. So this was the head I started with. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about um, carving the caricature head. We can do that, I think, as a separate piece some other time. But this is the, the female caricature head that I did. Um, again, it, as John just finished saying, it's an exaggeration. Female is a little bit more difficult to do an exaggeration of a caricature because you don't want, like a man, you can do a huge nose and huge ears and big bags under their eyes, but you don't want your, your female to look that way. But, you know, there are some things in the female face that you want to exaggerate, like the high cheekbones, a, a bigger than normal spot, smile, bigger than normal eyes, high eyebrows, those types of things. And as you think about putting a hat, and this was going to be a cowgirl, so she's going to have a cowboy hat, then the cowboy hat um, is made so that it sits on the head, and the head looks as if it's within the hat. And the only way you can do that is to cut a flat plane across where you think the brim of the hat is going to go. And so that's all I did was I just made a quick line. I used a handsaw. You can see it's a pretty rough cut here. I used a handsaw to cut that off. If, um, if, if I shouldn't say if, I'm going to say don't cut this off on a bandsaw. Um, it's very difficult to cut a rounded item on a bandsaw if you don't have a flat surface on the bed. It'll roll on you and the blade will catch and, and could hurt you, but it will certainly wreck the project. Uh, I just did it very quickly with a handsaw. Um, you wanted the top of this to be fairly smooth, so I took it to a little 
um, uh, rotary sandpaper, uh, that little Dremel sandpaper, four inch uh, sanding disc that you saw earlier. And I just smoothed this section off here so it'd be nice and smooth. Okay. <laughs> Anybody jump in if you want. There's not a lot of real special tools needed to, uh, to do the hat. Uh, these are the tools I use. So I use the glove for safety. I, I use that green tape around my thumb on my right, my right hand, my cutting hand, so that I wouldn't cut my thumb as I pulled the knife towards it. I use this flex cut knife. It's the one I showed you earlier. <laughs> And I use two gouges, a, a smaller gouge and a little bit broader gouge. And that's all I used. You see, I have my little, uh, my little um, strop here. And these are the things that I used. Um, I had started uh, putting a little bit of hair in uh, or some lines representing hair on this particular head, but I hadn't completed it yet. So I sanded this off smooth to accept the crown, and then I continued to go with the gouge and just made these hairlines. I made these two lines here just to show you uh, how you have to be careful about grain. And so the grain in this head is going in this direction, but because this is scooped in to the degree it is, I can cut, I can start here and gouge down along the green, but when I get to about here, I'm against the green. And if I kept pushing, I'd split that wood. So you have to stop there, you have to turn your gouge around, you come at your green this way and meet halfway. And so that's what I did all the way around. Okay, John, you wanted to make a comment, I think about these contours. Oh yeah, yeah, be careful of the flow. You wanna make sure that the flow of the hair, you don't wanna go straight up and down. Um, like what Mark did, it looks, looks like real hair, like you, you just the flow of the hair. You make some flow lines and uh, help yourself put some flow lines and, you know, and uh, make the hair look fluffy. Right. Okay, and so one of the things that we talked about earlier is that although John and I don't sand our caricature carvings, we both sand lightly the heads. And so you can see here, you can still see the knife marks in the face, the flat planes. You can still certainly see gouge marks here, some flat planes, but you can also note that it's sanded a bit. And that's the only part of a caricature carver, carving rather that I sand just to make it look like skin and hair. Okay, so it's, it's a little bit smoother, but you can still see knife cuts in there. I think seeing the knife cuts is, um, is an advantage, okay? When you start thinking about the hat, you got to think about um, how is this head going to fit into the brim of the hat. So I just turned this, this flat, very smooth flat section over now on a piece of paper, and I just traced around the head. There's nothing more to it than that. Once I traced it around, and here's the trace, I just draw two parallel lines, and now I would be able to, so that would be the bird's eye view, the plan view. This would be the side view, and I was able to just put the, the head up to that side or that plan view and just draw what I thought would be a nice graceful curve for a brim. And then once I drew, drew that brim, I drew the crown and, I, and you're just eyeballing it. What does a crown look like? If you look at the, you know, to John's earlier point using references, look at hats, you know, go on the internet, Google hats. You'll find that the front has a little bit of a steeper slope than the back. The top is sort of crowned and, and uh, rises up at the front a little bit. So just look for things like that. If you, if you look real close, you can see the crown is a little bit broader than her head because I do want it to fit up inside. And you can see this on this side where I actually pushed it up beyond the brim to see if it was gonna fit the crown. And once I did that, I didn't like the height of the crown. I wanted it higher. So you can see I wrote, I drew another line in here just to make the crown a little bit higher. I, sh I should also mention that when I was, uh, when I was, when I cut her head off, the top of her head off, uh, because this part was going to fit in the crown, I necked this in a little bit more. So this might have been a little bit straighter when I cut it here. And I just, when I was putting her hair and I just gouged it a little bit more so that it fit a little bit nice, more nicely into the, into the crown. Okay, everybody following that? Yep. Okay, once I did that, I, I went back to the bird's eye view, the plan view, and I said, okay, I, I, I need the brim 
Again, look for references on how hats are made. Cowboy hats tend to be a little bit narrower at the front, come to a bit of a peak when you look up and down at them, and they're a little rounder at the back. Um, and John, I'll let you talk about where my hand is here because you've mentioned this to us before about drawing. Yeah, um, I well for a round circle like that, I I I I don't use my wrist. I use my elbow. It's more of a, a flowing line instead of you know using little short little lines, and it, it makes it a lot smoother of a of a line. So you couldn't, like, I couldn't have drawn that line if my hand was on this side going this right. way. There's no way I would have gotten that smooth. I needed to use my hand in this case, like a pivot. John was saying he can even go further back and uses his elbow as a pivot, but that's what pivots smoothly around there. And so then you start thinking, okay, how do I get that same shape on this side? So I have a symmetrical hat. Well, what you do is you draw that center line and you just fold it over and you cut the one line you made, you unfold it, and you have both sides the same, okay? Not rocket science, but something I wanted to talk to you about. Okay, then it goes to the bandsaw. And so I took a, a chunk of wood, it might have been an inch and a half uh, basswood, drew that plan view of the brim on the wood. I cut off the pieces. You can see this piece cut off in one piece that fit here. This broke into two pieces. I glued it all back together after I did that. And when I say I glued that back together, one dab of white glue on each one of these sections, stick it together, let it sit there for 10 minutes, and it's firm enough that you can bring it back to the bandsaw. I did that so that I would have a flat section on the back here to put against the bandsaw bed and have a flat section on the top to draw the side view of the brim. Okay, and so here's that side view of the brim that we just drew on top of that uh, that glued together basswood. These here sections you see, this section here is that chunk, this section here is that chunk, okay? They're just glued back on. Went to the bandsaw and it comes out looking like that. So once you, once you cut it on the bandsaw, knock all the pieces off, you can see the little mm -hmm. glue dab right there that was on that I knocked off. You have to knock it off with a hammer, it, it sets that quickly. And now you bring that to, uh, to um, your carving table. The grain goes in this direction. So just like I was mentioning with respect to the hair watching the grain of the wood, the grain is going here, but because I've got this now, this curve at the top, I have to start my gouge here and go in that direction. Then I have to turn around and start my gouge here and go in that direction. If I started back here to go in that direction, I just split the wood. I'd be going against the grain and I'd just start splitting wood. The center section is, is you're starting to figure out, okay, this isn't gonna be straight up and down the side of the, the hat. It's gonna have a curve, it's gonna be curled in. So I started just curling it in with a knife. I left it flat at the bottom, but I just started curling it in so I'd know what I could take out in the center and what I'd wanna leave. And I wanted to leave that ridge and I wanted to leave that ridge. And then I just put it on a, a, a little, um, jig that John actually made me that fits up against my workbench. It's got a lip on this side. I can push against it and it doesn't go anywhere. So I would take my gouge, I'd start shaving that in that direction. I turn this around and then I'd start shaving in this direction until I was happy with it. Now I'll mention to you here, um, uh, and I'll mention probably a couple more times, Carving isn't like making plastic models, isn't it? Like they don't snap together. You're always, you're always doing something. And so, so keep that in mind that, you know, you might think you've finished here putting this curve in and you start taking out the center and say, geez, maybe I want a little bit more curve. You're always shaping, you're always modifying. You just got to keep looking at it and taking a little bit off at a time. Okay. So once I was satisfied that I had the kind of a curve coming in the top, I had taken a bit out of the middle to get a sense of what that brim was going to look like. Then I wanted to start working on that where the head was going to fit. So I, I, with a pair of scissors, I just cut out that pattern that I had made. I put it approximately where I thought the head would fit. You can see I penciled it in and then I put the, the, head, the, the brim on top of the head just to see what it would look like. You can see the head here is pretty flat across where I had cut it. The brim now has a curve to it. So really the head's only touching there and it's touching there. And so 
as a course adjustment, I took a knife and I started cutting a little bit of the head away here. And I started cutting a little bit of the head away here, just so that it fit a little bit tighter up into the brim before I got too detailed with it. And then because even though I took the front and top of the head off a little bit, there was still quite a gap in there. It still wasn't fitting right up into the, into the uh, little crown that I made. Uh, I needed to use that process that we talked about of using the graphite or the lead. And so I needed a dowel to place between the head and the brim so that I could locate that each time that I use that leading or graphite process. So I just found the center, turned the hat over, found the center, drilled a 3 16 inch hole through. I had, I had a 3 16 inch dowel. I glued the dowel in the, through the head. So I put the, I should say, I put this on top of the head, drilled through that so I'd find the same location, glued the dowel into the head, and now I could put that dowel in this brim always in the same place. I did, I put it in the same place. I went around with a pencil one more time because I knew I could make a fairly close adjustment or a coarse adjustment of what I wanted to carve away. You can see I carved away maybe a 16th of an inch there. And then I leaded or graphited the top of the head with the intent of putting the dowel through and letting that graphite or lead transfer to the bottom of the brim. Then from there, I just, I just put that dowel in, let the lead show up here. You can see where it, all the high spots are. There's some high spots even around the rim where her head fit. And so, you know, when you do this, you don't want to just do the, that top part of the head. You want to do a little bit of a ways around the hair because it's going to fit in there and you'll want to know where that needs to fit. And then I just took a gouge and I took away only those graphite spots. So, you know, I'll, 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 I'll be really plain about this. Like if that's the graphite spot, I didn't take a chunk like this out, right? I just took that graphite spot out. I just took that graphite spot, out, just that one. And you keep doing that four or five or six or seven times. And pretty soon you got a real nice tight fit that looks like she's wearing the hat because the head now fits right within the brim of the hat. Okay, I'll stop there. If there's any questions, then I'll just keep firing. Okay, so then the, the next piece was to make the brim. So this was the, the section that I cut out where her head fit in. I used a piece of wood where the grain went this way. You could do it with the grain going in the opposite direction. I find this a little bit easier because I know I'm gonna be cutting away these pieces and it's just easier to cut with the grain rather than across grain. And so that's what I did. I cut away all along this line here so that it, it, uh, it went up in the, in the shape that I wanted it to. And so it had to, as we said earlier, I wanted kind of a, a steep slope here and a more uh, shallow slope down here. Uh, and I wanted the whole thing necking up, right? So I started to get that. And you can see the, it's fitting now within the brim. I, I would have done two things at this point. I would have looked at that brim and say, okay, how much more do I want to cut out of this brim without cutting through the brim? So I would have been shaving some of this off. I'd be looking at this and saying, well, you know, I, I don't really need to lead this at this point or graphite this at this point. I can see a big chunk has to come off of here. And a big chunk has to come off of there to get that anywhere near the brim. And so that's what I would have done. You can see I started to carve away each side that I just spoke to. Um, I, I took the, the dowel that I had and I just protruded through the top of the brim just a hair, just enough to put some lead or graphite on that. And then when I put this brim, or this crown rather, on the brim, it left a mark where I needed to drill. And once I had that mark, I knew that was exactly where the crown had to sit. I drilled through that. And now I was able to do the same process. Uh, I extend this dowel out further. I, I leaded this here area. I continued shaving that away. When I was happy with it, I did the opposite. I leaded the bottom of this crown. And, and left uh, you know, graphite on, on this part. So it was a little bit coming off of the crown, a little bit coming off of the brim until I was happy that this fit was as tight as I wanted it to be. And you, you can get a pretty tight fit if you're, if you're working at it. 
you know, at that point, you're happy with the fit. I added in a little band here. I just cut in a little band. And then I looked at different hats and there's all different styles of hats. And so I just made mine with a, a like a, a, a dip in the center and off to the side. And, and you can't see it very well because of the lighting here on the photograph, but there's a chunk out of here as well to make it look, uh, to make it look like a cowboy hat. And then that's what you end up with. Okay, folks. Very nice, Mark. Good. Better than okay, Mark. That was awesome. Okay. So thanks, Daniel. So, so, you know, give that a try. And again, you know, I'll, I'll, um, you know, I'll just, I'll just say to you again, keep in mind that like you, you can't go step by step with this kind of stuff. Like if there's 10 steps, you might do step three, five times, right? Because you're, you're carving, you're trying to shape, you're shaping one piece, you're shaping the other piece. You're not happy. You keep going back and forth until you're happy with it. And, and, and you'll get that to that point where, where the hat looks like everything fits together and it's fitting on the head. Okay. So have I worn you guys out or do you want to look at the next piece on sculpting? Sculpting, a <laughs> couple, couple of thumbs up. So we'll do sculpting. Okay. Yeah, sculpting, sure. All right. Okay, so clay modeling and sculpting. So very quickly, this is again, this is the way I do it. People do it differently. Um, if you guys recall one of our earlier sessions, Mike Sullivan went over it and uh, I'd have to go back at the session to see what kind of modeling clay he used, but he used a different modeling clay than I use and had a lot of success with it. So, you know, try different things, try uh, different modeling clays. I'm just gonna talk to you about the one that I happen to use and I have really no good reason why I use it other than that's what I started with. The first thing I do is I make an armature. And so the armature, excuse me, the armature I make is out of household copper wire. So just take, uh, if you can still afford household copper wire, uh, take a chunk, a couple chunks, strip off the black and white, and you end up with the copper wire. Um, put one in, you know, loop it around, put the looped end in a, in a vise or a drive a nail into your workshop bench and <coughs> wind that around the nail and the loose ends chuck into uh, a portable drill. Don't use a, a plug-in drill because they're too fast. You gotta go slow with this. Um, and so then you just start winding the stuff. And, and if you go slow and you're pulling a little bit on the drill, uh, you get a really nice uh, winding here. This is strangely satisfying. I have no idea why, but it's really, it's really satisfying to do. Um, I've used this method a lot for um, doing the sculptures, but if you use something lighter, like a 16 gauge or 18 gauge baling wire, it makes a terrific rope. If you have, are adding rope of any sort to uh, one of your carvings, if you're doing a cowboy as an example, uh, it makes a terrific rope. And so it, it's a really easy process to use. Now with this copper wire, what I did was because it's heavy, you've, you've, put, you've twined two together. Um, I used it for the spine and the legs and I used a single strand for the arms. Now what you see here is I went, uh, because I knew she was gonna be a cowgirl, and I went to, um, uh, I think it was Pinterest, and I found uh, something anatomical here, a pattern of a woman. Now, this woman is already exaggerated. Her legs are a little bit longer than, you know, the anatomy of a woman. Uh, her, her torso is a little bit shorter, but that's what I wanted. I wanted a caricature kind of style um, of, of a female form. And so I took this, I just printed it out on the computer to the size that I wanted my sculpture to be. And then I took a, the spine. I, you, you can't really see it in here, but I made it so that the spine was kind of curved like this. So, you, you know, it comes in and out. <coughs> and I took the legs, I put the hips here and I, you know, I made sure I have enough room for, for, uh, for ankles and up on, on toes a bit with, if, because she'd be wearing cowboy boots. And then I got the arms and the shoulders right. And what I did was uh, I just take a little piece of light copper wire and I twine it around here and I twine it around there and I solder those two in place so that this thing isn't sloppy at all. I mean, I can move the arms, I can move the legs and nothing's going to be sloppy in it at all. Now, I wanted this particular cowgirl to be playing a banjo. And so what I did was I took from that 
anatomical chart picture that I had. I took all the measurements from the shoulder to the arm, to the elbow, elbow to the wrist, hip to knee, knee to ankle, and I transferred them to my wire. So you can see here with just a Mylar pen, I've got the knees in here. You can see it less well here with the ankles. Uh, again, the ankles are kind of high because she's, I wandered her being in cowboy boots, but you can see the elbows as an example here. And so now, no matter how I moved that copper um, armature, uh, as long as I didn't uh, move off of those joints, I knew the anatomy was going to be right. The other thing you have to watch, of course, is, is you're not doing anything with these joints that you can't do yourself. So, you know, you're not going to take this and bend it backwards that way. So, you know, you're saying to yourself, okay, would a person be able to stand like this with one knee forward, with one shoulder a little higher than the other and that type of thing. <clears throat> now the clay I use is this, this clay, it comes in 10 pound blocks, only $15. Um, it is latex. Uh, so you can buy all different types of clay. Uh, one type of clay people like using is an oil-based clay uh, because it pretty much stays, uh, stays pretty stable and dries really nicely. Um, the reason I use latex is it's cheap. It's 15 bucks for 10 pounds. And I've had this for years and years and years. You just keep adding water to it and, uh, and it comes back to life. You don't have to wear latex gloves like it's not oil based. So it's not going to harm you in any way or, or react with your skin. The downside of it is that it dries and it breaks up and cracks. And so it's not something that if you want to make a sculpture and keep it on your shelf forever, you won't be doing that. After a while, when this thing dries out, it just cracks to pieces and it's of no more use to you unless you add water. But what I do is I take that armature that I made and you can see I put a little bit of a curve in the spine and I got the arms about where I wanted for a banjo and that type of thing. I got the knee. You can't see it very well, but I got the knee forward here and this one a little straighter. And you take off pinches of this clay and you just start packing it onto the wire. Now, you know, when I started this, I thought to myself, you put all the clay on and then you start carving it off, but that's backwards. That's carving. This is just the opposite of carving. You're taking little pinches and you're packing it on where you think you need it until you get the sculpture you want. And so that's what I did. I had uh, my little uh, picture that I was going off of um, and I just started packing on clay and you can see it's a real rough process. Um, you know, I was trying to exaggerate things like a character. I didn't want her really busty. So I had a kind of fairly a normal torso, but I gave her huge legs and a huge rear end. And, uh, and that was the way I exaggerated her body. And I got to this point. And so, you know, I was able to plug the head in now and say, geez, does this all look right? I put just a little uh, spatula there that I used for, for some of the clay work in her hand to make it look like a banjo. And I thought, yeah, that's kind of looking at kind of what I had in mind for the wood carving. Now this chart is worth a million dollars because this is the, the point that I want to drive home with you is the, is the greatest value around sculpting. So you can see, you can see here, I did a pretty nice job. Like she, that would make a nice carving. It, you might say it's a little static, you know, she's kind of standing up straight and her, her knees kind of forward here is nice, her heels up a little bit at the back here, it looks nice. But I thought, okay, how can we improve that? And all I did was I grabbed her by here, the waist here, and I drove the hip out this way. And just by driving that hip out, it caused this wire and clay, which is pliable, of course, it's wet, to all of a sudden curve out. It caused this leg all of a sudden to buckle a bit at the knee. So the knee came in even further and the heel went up. It caused her right shoulder to drop way down and her left shoulder to come up. And then I twisted the whole thing. So I brought her left shoulder forward and her right shoulder back. And all of a sudden she looked like a banjo player, like a country banjo player, right? She went from kind of static up and down, if you can see there, to something where her head's off to the side. She just There's just motion in that carving now, right? It really made a difference, didn't it? I it think really it did. did. Yeah, yeah I, I, yeah, I think it did. And, I, and I've had that experience before. You guys have seen that little guy uh, that I, carrying all the boxes and things, right? So I did that guy in clay. And the first time I did it, it looked okay, but it didn't look like he was under a very heavy load until I put my hand on it and I just squished him. I just 
I just squished him down an inch and a half. And then he looked, you know, his knees bent, his head bent, his back bent. He looked like he was under a heavy load. And, it, and, and to me, like, you know, John's an excellent artist uh, for drawing and sketching. He may have been able to come up with this. I wouldn't have been able to come up with this. I would have come up with this, but I wouldn't have come up with the drawing to go by unless I had this clay sculpture that I now manipulated to look like that. And now I have a 3D model of well, what I thought was a better sculpture. Okay. And so based on that, because this is uh, late latex, it's uh, water-based. You can see I have a little margarine tub back here. It had some water and I just dipped my finger in it. And you can just smooth this stuff out this easily with just your finger, you know, you don't need a towel or anything. Just dip your finger in that. It, it, it smooths all out. So that's what I did. I just smoothed, smoothed her all out. And so that's what now her body would look like. And now I said to myself, okay, you know, if I took that to the bandsaw as a pattern, uh, I'd be able to do her body, but nothing more. And so I added a little more detail. So I said, well, I'm going to want her to have boots. So I put in a really quick boots here and it was just pinching that clay, flattening it out, wrapping it around. That's all there is to it. I gave her a little cuffs around, uh, like uh, shirt cuffs around her wrists. I thought, geez, a vest would look kind of cute. So I, I flattened some clay. I just put in a vest, I put in a scarf. And now when I have that as a pattern, I know that I can't bring to the bandsaw and cut off here. I need to be able to cut way back here because I want that vest in there or I need that belt in there, okay? Now, I mentioned to you the downside of this stuff is it dries out and it dries out really quickly. And so what I do before I go to bed at night is I just take some kitchen paper towels, you know, the white paper towels, and I soak them with water and I just drape them over the, the sculpture. This is just a, a shoppering uh, plastic bag. I put that over the top and that's enough to keep it humid uh, till the next time I come and work on it. If I didn't do that, it would dry out pretty quickly and start to shrink and crack. Okay, so, so that's what I do to combat this business about it being uh, water-based. And so that's what I ended up with. So that is my pattern. And what I did was exactly what you see here. As I took a picture of it, uh, you know, a fairly low picture of it, as straight as I could at it. I took a front view and both side views. And that's the pattern I brought to the bandsaw. So here's exactly what you just saw, printed out on a computer, the size I wanted, cut out exactly the way I wanted it to look. I laminated two pieces of basswood together. I drew that on the top. Here you can see the vest that I would have cut off if I hadn't included the vest in my clay. You can see her full shape here right down to the boots. And then I cut that out on the bandsaw. Again, I kept the pieces. So you can see all the pieces that I've glued here so that my next cut, I'd have a flat surface on the bandsaw. On the top, I just put a glob of glue like that, put it back in place and the same thing along here. And so now when I have the side view, I just draw that side view on here. I have a flat surface to draw the side view on. I have a flat surface to run along the bandsaw, blade, uh, bandsaw bed and I cut out the, the side view. I'll point out to you here, it's not a great photo, but I mentioned to you that her right leg was forward and her left leg was back. So you can see here, this is her right leg, this is her left leg. You're not cutting out this on the right side, you're cutting out the whole thing because you need that left leg on the other side, okay? And so that's why you see this big bulge here, that's her left leg, whereas this is the front of her right leg, okay? So I cut that out and that's what you end up with. And that's what you begin to, um, to, to, uh, to rough out. Now, uh, could I have cut out the arms? Yeah, I could have left the arms in the pattern, but I wanted to show you guys in our next uh, session how to add arms. So I intentionally uh, cut these arms off. And, um, and uh, the next time we're together, we'll take it from here. And, uh, and I'll show you how I rough that out. Okay, guys, did you follow that or was it too quick? Good work there, Mark. Yeah, okay. I liked it, Mark, it was good. Yeah, well, get, get, give those things a try. You know, it, re regardless of the, uh, the kind of carving you're doing, the, all of these sort of techniques fit all of the carvings we do. So just, just give them a try and practice them and have fun with it.